Uh, okay, so I think that's about it, and we'll get into our first speaker that um, we are just so, so uh, grateful to have. Um, I had the privilege of hearing TJ speak uh, at the Animal Rights Conference last year, and it was so incredibly powerful. I said, I want him at the Conscious Eating Conference. Uh, so we were lucky that we were able to get him. Um, uh, it, it's TJ Tumas. He spent more than uh, six years working in over 30 states as an undercover investigator in commercial farms, local shelters, and roadside zoos. Uh, his cases led to groundbreaking criminal co uh, convictions of felony abuse for farmed animals. Uh, TJ's been interviewed or quoted on ABC, Nightline, 2020, and numerous other podcasts, blogs, and websites. And he's currently managing the new Animal Legal Defense Fund Undercover Investigative Department. Uh, you know, undercover investigators are really, really the true heroes of this movement. Uh, I think everyone can agree with me there. Their um, bravery and courage is just unbelievable. And I'm so, so honored that we have uh, a true hero with us here today. So please help me welcome TJ Tumas. Uh, thank you, Hope, and everyone for being here. Um, thanks to UPC and all the sponsors, everyone who put on the event. Um, it's, it's really great to see so many people come out here so early on a Saturday. Um, hopefully, hopefully the content isn't, uh, I mean, it's going to be pretty heavy, but hopefully it's not too much um, to handle at this early hour. Um, so what I, what I want to talk about, just jumping right into it here, is um, something that we hear a lot in our culture, in our society, in our world. It's the term humane. What is humane? And I want to start off um, by, by just kind of demonstrating, first of all, what an illusion is so that we can understand the term humane as it applies to animals in society and in our world. The definition of an illusion is a state or fact of being intellectually deceived, misled. It's a misapprehension, such deception. An image presented to the vision or something that misleads or deceives intellectually. And I would add intentionally to that. This definition is vital in understanding the deception of what is called humane when it comes to animal production and animal agriculture. Let me give you all an example of an illusion. This is going to be one that you're familiar with. Morning. So what do you think then? Get an early start on that alfalfa on the back 40? What's the hurry? Hit the snooze. Great cheese comes from happy cows. Happy cows come from California. Real California cheese. Right? Everybody's familiar with these, with these ads here in California especially. This could not be a more complete illusion. Intentional intellectual deception. Humane. Characterized by tenderness, compassion, and sympathy for people and animals, especially for the suffering and the distressed. Take notice here that it says people and animals. It doesn't make a distinction. It doesn't say people or animals. This is right out of Webster, OK? That's what humane means. And that's similar to the commercial for happy cows that we just saw. They try to say it's characterized by tenderness and compassion and sympathy. The cows laying in the straw, the iconic barn with the cute little tractor, the beautiful hillside. This is truly an illusion. This is an actual dairy farm. 
In this eyewitness footage, cows whose sensitive noses can smell odors up to six miles away are made to trudge through deep manure. The cows cannot escape swarms of flies. The cows must stand in their own waste while eating or trying to rest. The dairy factory's manure was not cleared out for so long that it hardened. Manure coats the animal's legs and splashes onto their udders moments before they are milked. Here you see the untreated, overgrown right hoof of a cow identified only as two by a tag on her ear. A thick layer of manure is caked on her legs. Here she hobbles out of the milking parlor. Putting weight on her overgrown hoof caused her severe pain. This is also cow two as she stands in the milking parlor. Her bones protrude sharply and she is emaciated. Producing milk requires cows to expend a tremendous amount of energy. Cows denied proper nutrition and care can quickly become emaciated. This is cow 188 who is little more than a skeleton. Here cow six bleeds from the nose attracting more flies. At night, cows have no grass, straw, or bedding to lie down on to get out of the manure, and they can't rest because flies keep biting them. If you do not wish to support the dairy industry's cruelty to cows, please go vegan. This, I think, pretty clearly demonstrates the difference between a reality and an illusion. The difference between what is called humane. I'm going to take a minute here and describe some of the things that happen to dairy cows and to beef cows. Um, the family owned dairy farms that I've worked at, that I've seen the inside of, have conditions much like this. They overpack and overcrowd more and more animals into their facility because they're a small family owned operation and they're trying to keep up with large agribusinesses. The problem is that they add more and more animals and they do not have the staff and the equipment and the space to adequately care for all of them. And just as the video showed, their udders become covered in manure. Disease is rampant, they're full of pus. I mean, it's, it's, it's excruciating. And it's disturbing to know that that type of product is what's being sold to people. The milking machines have, when you, when you put a milking machine on a cow's udder, it has a little window in the, like down in the bottom of, of the suction part of the machine. And you can often see blood in it going right into the milk. The speed, the conditions, the disease, these things are all really, really excruciating to see. But what's probably the worst part of the dairy industry is seeing their children stolen from them. Hearing them cry out longingly for their babies and hearing the babies cry for their mothers as any human child would do, so do dairy cows and their children. All they want is that affection and that compassion of their, their parent. And they're denied it. They're ripped away and thrown in what looks like a, a dog house or a wooden box with a chain around their neck. The female babies are kept and raised to replace their mothers, who will soon die. In the wild, in the wild, in, in a more natural setting, 
in a more natural setting, um, dairy cows can live between 25 and 30 years. In the dairy industry, they don't make it past six most of the time. They are so diseased and, and, and atrophied and, and abused and beaten up by what's happening that they often die between three and six years old. And usually what this means is going to slaughter. Some of them die at the facility. The ones who don't, the ones who do make it that long, are put on transport trucks. And they're shipped for days, some of them, across the US to slaughterhouses. Cows walking down the chute are forced to do it by being electrocuted. It's long rods that have battery operated, it's, it's like a taser. It's like, it's like a taser that the police would use. Something similar to that anyway. And they're shocked with these and they're made to walk down this concrete chute into the slaughterhouse. And when they're doing it, they cry. It's, it's awful. Their tears flow from their eyes with the fear of their demise. The same way that we fear our own death, so do they. And they are every bit as aware and conscious as we would be in that same situation. They go down the chute to a point where they're held in a stall and they have what's called a captive bolt gun put up to their head right here. This is an air-powered pneumatic machine that shoots a six-inch rod out of the front of the machine and then sucks it back in again. And it's supposed to pierce the prefrontal lobe on a cow and render them unconscious. But Temple Grandin herself, who's an uh, animal welfare advocate and, and designs a lot of the slaughter facilities that are considered the most humane, has said that 98% of all slaughter operations fail to properly incapacitate animals all of the time. So we have this idea that these companies care so much for these animals and they sell us these illusions like the happy cows commercial. And the reality is much different than that. I'm gonna give you a couple of statistics. This graphic shows population density of the lower 48 states in the US. That's roughly 318 million people represented in that graphic. In order to house and produce and feed 318 million people with what's considered humane, like what we saw in the Happy Cows commercial, it's, um, it's one of the biggest illusions that they're selling us. This map, this map shows where the humans live in the US. But what it doesn't show is that roughly one third of that usable land mass, okay, that's, that's the usable land in the US, one third of it is connected to factory farming. All right, that doesn't include these areas where people live. And it doesn't include mountain ranges or deserts or places that animals can't be raised. One third of that land mass roughly is connected to factory farming. And they wanna tell us that it's humane and that it's possible to take care of animals, 
properly and treat them kindly. But what they don't tell you is that with the concept of what we consider humane, like the Happy Cows commercial, it would take every square inch of land in Canada, the United States, and Mexico to feed those 318 million people or to give them milk and egg products. That's every square inch of land. The mountain ranges, the deserts, and everywhere that people live. It is truly an illusion and not possible. This is made worse by the fact that with this greenwashing, they also are not protecting animals the way that they say they are. There are no federal laws governing the conditions in which farmed animals are raised at all. They're exempt from state animal cruelty statutes. And many individual states have criminal anti-cruelty laws that exempt standard practice or commonly accepted agriculture methods. So what does that all mean? That means that things like tail docking, dehorning, teeth cutting, castration, gestation crates, all of these things that are considered standard industry practice, that's all legal. It's all exempt from animal cruelty. Everything that if, you would, if someone did it to a dog that they would go to jail for, if they did it to a cow or a pig, it's considered legal under the law in every state in the US. The, <laughs> the reality of these places is truly horrendous. Pigs are confined in crates so small that they can't roll over or turn around. They, they can't lay down comfortably. They can barely move. Pigs are one of the most intelligent creatures out there. I've worked on farms where the farmers had, you know, the, the people that worked on the farms had relationships with these animals. I worked on a farm in Minnesota where this girl who worked with me, her name was Courtney, she had a, she had a pig who she was friends with. She would take candy back and give, give the pig candy. They are social, intelligent beings. And they're crammed into these cages that are so small and so tight that it literally drives them insane. They shake back and forth, and they bite the bars, and they rub their heads against it to the point that they have sores and infections. And it's, it's so demoralizing to see, to realize that this is what's happening all across the United States at a rate that we can't even imagine. This brings me to, to chickens, something that happens with chickens. They are crammed into battery cages where each bird has less space than a notebook-sized sheet of paper to live their entire lives. They can't get away from their cage mates. They're trampled to death by the other birds that live with them if they can't get away. The reality of their suffering, where they're thrown in and out of cages just for egg production, is unfathomable to us. When they go to slaughterhouses, 
they let, let me let me describe let me describe a, a typical chicken slaughter plant. You walk in you walk into uh, onto the kill floor or into the live hang room, and it's completely dark. There aren't any lights on because chickens, as we know, are flight animals. They try to run away, and if it's light in there, they're going to try to fly and flap and run away more than they do anyway. There's a set of shackles, what's called shackles, which is basically an assembly line with these W-shaped hooks that go by overhead and a conveyor belt that comes in the opposite direction. Chickens are dumped by forklifts out of cages onto this conveyor belt and they're brought into the factory that way. You have groups of workers who stand at the line, usually about 10 workers per side. And these men pick up the birds, hold them by the ankles with their foot sticking between your first and second finger, and they hang them in the shackles over and over again all day long. They do this at a rate of 35 birds a minute. That's, that's the speed at which the shackles are going by, 35 a minute. So each man on the line is responsible for hitting, if there are 10 men, each 10th shackle. So the first guy hangs the first bird, he skips nine shackles, and he hangs another one. Well, what does that mean? That means that each man has to pick up, invert, and hang a bird every 1.71 seconds all day long. That's 2,100 chickens an hour for each man. In an eight-hour shift, that's 16,800 chickens. For each worker, they hang two shifts. So that means each facility produces 336,000 chickens <laughs> every shift and 672,000 every day. That's nearly three and a half million chickens each week that die in one facility. In America alone, just talking about land animals, cows, pigs, chickens, and then a few goats and sheep and other animals, we slaughter <laughs> 10,000 animals a second. One Mississippi, 10,000 animals just die. in the most egregious ways that you can imagine. Captive bolt guns, dull knives slid across your throat. I mean, it is truly unimaginable. And it is truly an illusion that they try to say, this is humane. Now, most of you like me, may say, why? Why? Why do we do this? Why, TJ, is this happening? The simple answer is that things like this are profitable. This shows a cage-free egg-laying facility. This is what's considered humane. This is what they're greenwashing. That's the term that we use, to sell people products. Many times, these things are worse. In these types of facilities, anything that scares the chickens, which remember we discussed, are flight animals. They try to run away. Guess what happens when you have thousands of birds in one shed and they all try to run the same direction? They crush each other and smother each other to death.
these terms, free range, cage free, humane, many times these facilities are actually worse than the CAFOs, the concentrated animal feeding operations or factory farms. Neither, neither style is humane. By the definition, tenderness, compassionate, concern for the well-being and the suffering of others. What it comes down to is the almighty dollar. The ability to profit from animal abuse will not end until we stop paying these farms to abuse animals on our behalf. That's why veganism is so important. It is the greatest way to protest social injustice in our world, hands down. These producers don't want anyone to know this. They, they want to keep what's happening hidden from us. They want to sell us an illusion because it's profitable. And that ability to profit is so valuable to them that they're trying to make it illegal. There are seven states in the U.S. that have now passed egg gag laws. Utah, Idaho, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, and Montana. I love what Ken Paulson said about it. He's a professor at MTSU, that's Middle Tennessee State University. It's not only constitutionally suspect, it's terrible public policy on the part of the legislature. Give me the very best argument for why this needs to be in place, and then tell me why you wouldn't then pass similar legislation for daycare centers. Would anyone suggest that you would send someone to prison for documenting child abuse? Is there anyone who is going to a lesser standard for animal abuse? Or, um, excuse me, who is going to run on that platform? Why in the world do we have a lesser standard for animal abuse? The answer is that animals aren't people, but the broader point is that the health of animals affects the health of people. Included is the, the Wikipedia link right there to egg gag. Um, you, can, you can look that up if you'd like on, on your own. It demonstrates what, what many states have done or are trying to do when it comes to egg gag laws. They're trying to make people like myself look like criminals. They've even gone as far as to call us terrorists. When we try to be more compassionate and more humane than the other people at these facilities. That doesn't sound at all like what I think of. When, uh, when people talk about terror, right? The reason that uh, they're getting away with doing this, something that most people have no idea about, is the fact that animal agriculture, special interest groups for animal agriculture, have the fourth largest lobby on Congress in the United States. It is profitable for them to lie to us, to try to silence people like me, and to sell the public an illusion. And that's why they keep doing it. I have one more definition that I want to read for you today. The action or practice of inflicting severe pain on someone as punishment or to force them to do something, or for the pleasure 
of the person inflicting the, the pain. Great psychological or mental suffering or anxiety. To cause suffering or anxiety. Now that, that sounds a lot like what we've discussed with animal agriculture, with food production, doesn't it? Does anyone want to take a guess what those definitions, what word they belong to? Terror. Terror. That's what terror is. All these horrible things that we've talked about, that I've described, that are done to these animals, I can tell you that that's terror, that it's torture. I have seen the insides of these industries, these farms, CAFOs, the largest factory farms in the United States, the largest com companies, down to the family-owned farms. And pretty typically, it's terror and torture. If you were confined in a milking stall yourself, if you had your child stolen from you because it was profitable for someone else, what would you want me to say on your behalf? If you were crammed into a gestation crate where you couldn't turn around, where you couldn't lie down comfortably, where you could barely move, where your children were taken from you, like what happens to sows on pig farms, what would you want me to say on your behalf? <laughs> the, the, uh, the set of tools and supplies used to artificially inseminate pigs on, on hog farms, you know what they call that in the industry? It's called a rape kit. If you were smashed into a battery cage, forced to lay eggs the way chickens are, what would you want me to say for you then? If it was your life, your family, your future. What would you want others to choose to eat? Our choices matter more than ever. Leonardo da Vinci famously said, there will come a day when men such as I look upon the murder of animals the way that we now look upon the murder of men. He said that a long time ago. And it's taken this long for people to start standing up for these animals who suffer egregiously the terror inflicted upon them. ALDF is a great organization when it comes to resources for farmed animals and the law. That's why I think it's so important to work with an organization that stands up for the legal rights of animals, which is more than anything else our mission. We are challenging the position that these farms take, that, that our legislatures take, that says animals are objects, because they're not. They are every bit 
as conscious and aware and sentient as you and I, and they suffer every bit the same sort of torture that you and I would. There's a website, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give this website to you later, leave it up if I can. Um, we do a lot with truth in advertising. And it's important because the Happy Cows commercial, it's an illusion. It's a lie. I have one more video. This shows egg production. that is humane, characterized by compassion or tenderness, especially for the suffering or distressed, when in reality, it's torture and it's terror. This is why This is why I want to talk about this, because people 
don't know this reality most of the time. And that's also why it's so important every day the choice that we make to not allow animal agriculture and food producers to profit from this kind of torture. Taking a stand against these companies and voting against this kind of abuse by not spending your money on these products at the store matters to these animals. And it matters to me. It is not a means to an end. Any amount of good that we do to reduce the suffering of others is an end in and of itself. It's a complete act. You can't buy it with money. You can't win it in a war. To reduce the suffering of another living being is priceless. Because after that moment, no matter what happens in the world, to any of us or all of us, their lives were made better by that act of compassion. Choosing that compassion every day is priceless. There's, there's really nothing more that I can say than that. I'm going to quote Nietzsche. Sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. This illusion has to be destroyed. It has to be. Because I have taken part in it. And I've seen it for myself. And I can tell you that it is torture and it is wrong. And that compassion, mainly the compassion of a cruelty-free lifestyle, is imperative for a society that has moral values. I'll leave you with that. Um, I think we have about. <laughs> I think I think we have about five minutes left. I can take a couple of uh, questions. We'll start right right, right here. Um, the investigations landscape, so to speak, is much more difficult now um, than it was when I started out in 2007. Um, these companies are aware that there are many, many people and many organizations who are taking a stand against them. And so it's much harder to get hired and to get in and get the evidence and get the footage. Um, but I think in a lot of ways it's, it's, it's also getting better. Um, when, I, when I went vegan nearly 10 years ago, the town I was living in, in Kentucky, um, the grocery store there had no vegan options in it whatsoever. Now, that same grocery store in that town has an entire organic section with almost any vegan option you could want. That, to me, says a lot. We are making a difference. Um, let's, right here. Um, no, I have not personally worked there. Uh, she, she asked if um, I had done undercover work at a place called Strauss Creamery. Okay, um, in the back. Sure, sure. Um, 
one one of the one of the greatest things in in our world that we can do is is much good while we're able. Um, I take the approach that any reduction in suffering is at least something of a victory. So even um, you know this 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 investigation, for example, was was one that I one that I did when I was at Mercy for Animals, but. Um, to allow the, the chickens to have at least a little more space and, and to be able to move around and to experience less suffering is better than to have them confined horribly. Um, all that to sort of say incremental change, I think, is, is somewhat necessary. Um, this isn't going to happen overnight. And um, that's a hard question. To answer, each person sort of has to come at that uh, on their own. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Um, I mean, in, 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 a lo in a lot of ways, I mean, I, I don't want to try to speak for her, but my understanding is that she thinks it's okay to um, kill and eat animals as long as we're nice to them first, um, <laughs> which I disagree with. Um, I think that's about all the time. That, uh, all right, we'll take one more. One more question. Um, so, so the question was, in case anyone didn't hear it, if factory farming were to end tomorrow, what would we do with all of these animals? Um, the, there, there's, there's, there's not a real easy way to answer that, but I can say for certain if we didn't create all of these animals' lives, we wouldn't have to find ways to end their lives. They are bred by us. And, and produced as items, not individuals. Um, so it, it's very, very difficult to say what would happen because it won't end tomorrow, but. Right, but that's what, it's, it's not going tomorrow if you're gradually, gradually breeding the animals. Right. Stop breeding them, demand goes down, it's going to be a, a gradual phasing out. Yeah. All right, and let's give a round of applause for TJ Janos. Thanks so much.